Welcome to Breakthrough Success. I am your host, Mark Roberti, founder of the Content Marketing Plaza, bringing you three new episodes each week where I and top-level guests teach you how to take your business to the next level and achieve your breakthrough. And before we jump into today's episode, let me ask you a quick question. How much would your life change if you can make six figures from your content? Imagine being able to quit your 9-to-5 job, do what you love for a living, and spend more time with your family. That's what we help our students do at the Content Marketing Plaza, an eight-week program that will help you build your way to six figures via your content. You can learn more about the Plaza by heading over to contentmarketingplaza.com, which will be in the show notes. All right, let's jump right back into the episode. Time is a very limited commodity. I think we all get that. I think we've all heard the idea that, oh, time is the most valuable resource, and it definitely is. And this is where we think about how long it takes to build a company, how long it takes to make the revenue that you want to be making. And the reason I bring that up is because you may want to consider a different way to get into business. And you may decide instead of creating a startup, taking a few years to build it up, which in most cases, it does take a few years to make a profit. There are some exceptions, but that's the norm. Uh, You can instead buy companies and then grow them. And this is a quicker path into starting your own business and possibly bringing in some nice cash flow as well. And today's guest who is going to be talking with us about this, he is an acquisition entrepreneur and investor who has co-founded three startups and acquired seven companies. So he knows both sides of the coin very well. His book, Buy Then Build, shows readers how to generate profitable revenue by acquiring companies. And if you want to learn how to buy an existing company and using ownership as a path to financial independence, then his book and this episode are for you. So today's guest for episode 304 of the Breakthrough Success Podcast is none other than Walker Dybel. Walker, it is such a pleasure to have you on the show. Mark, I'm so happy to be here. I'm so blessed to be your guest for number 304. (laughs) <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Walker, I'm really happy to have you on this episode today. And I really like this approach where, uh, I mean, you, you skip a few years in the process just by putting in an investment and that ability to make a profit and some consistent uh, flowing cash uh, by acquiring companies. So I'm really looking forward to diving into that. Before we do, though, I'd love if you could just give us some background into your book, Buy Then Build What? inspired you to write it sure so you know I the short answer is that you know I had to find out how to solve my own pain my own problem and that is that as someone who is entrepreneurial in their approach to life and to work um, the problem with starting a business is the fact that despite its popularity we really haven't engineered a better way to start up in other words, if you start a company, it can it can really be perceived as simply punishment for not understanding statistics. Um, uh, you know, you know, and I, I don't mean to crush everyone's dream. It's just that it's it's one of these things where when you look at you know the number of entrepreneurs that that start art a business from scratch, the amount that you know succeed after that, and then what that success actually looks like, uh, ninety ninety six percent of the time. Uh, is a company that results in under a million in revenue, um, you know, not not you know a very far cry from the sort of you know Elon Musk, Steve Jobs kind of you know influencer type levels, right? And so you know I've I've, I've we've I've been in startups that we've licensed disruptive technology. I've been in startups that have you know, have been finalists in, in, in business plan competitions. I've been in startups that have been oversubscribed. I've been in startups that have gone through top 10 accelerator programs. And it seems like every time I start up, no matter the level of talent, the, the market we were going into, the timing, the amount of cash we had, it, it never really seemed to work out for me. And when I looked into the empirical evidence, it seemed that this really wasn't only me, but rather 
uh, we're all out there hustling, trying to fulfill a dream. And, you know, sometimes you have to figure out a different approach to get there. And what I found over time was that buying existing businesses simply fast forwarded the startup killers and got me right to where I needed to be, which was running a successful company right away. And it's really interesting that you mentioned, I mean, I feel like a lot of people when they think about buying businesses, they think about that idea of uh, fast forwarding to the part where you have a business instead of those initial startup pains. And I mean, you gotta make sure you find the right business though. Uh, so I'm wondering what exactly goes into you determining what is the right business for you to acquire? That's such a great question. Um, I, you know, I, I spoke with someone today and, 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 you know, they said, you know, Walker, before I read your book, I've, I've been looking for a business to buy. And it seems like I, it seemed like I was reading prospectuses, you know, for a living, like, like I'm sitting here and I'm reading all of them. And every single one I look at, it's sort of like, wow, there are these 10 things that I could do to make this business awesome, right? Or whatever, take it to the next level, however you want to phrase it. Um, and then he said, but it wasn't until I read by the end build and actually learned about what, you know, your prep funnel and, you know, learning about how to fine tune what's important to me that I can actually start to cut out all of the distractions and start to, you know, look right at the ones that are, that are more meaningful. Um, what, I, what a lot of people try to do is they look at, Mark, let me start by saying, nine out of 10 people that actually decide acquisition entrepreneurship might be for them and start looking for a business, 90% of them will actually never pull the trigger on anything, okay? There's a couple reasons for that. One of them is that, um, well, one, one is that most work without a sense of urgency. We can go into that if you want, but the second one is that I believe that buyers really don't know what they're looking for in the first place. I see it time and time again. When you go through the prep funnel, instead of finding a, a business that, you know, is in an industry you like, that, you know, you have maybe experience in, that has, you know, um, it, you know whatever, all, it, it looks like, you know, you sort of are shopping on what's on the menu, right? And then sort of deciding what you're going to have for dinner. Instead, uh, what I do is I tell uh, my clients to, and the way that I do it myself is I, I look at, okay, what is my skill set? What is the day-to-day -day life that I want to be living? You know, what does it actually look like? And what is the growth opportunity that I can apply those two things to, right? Obviously, in the, in the book, I go into a lot more detail. But it, at the end of the day, it's not about trying to see what's on the menu or looking for an industry or a certain size, but rather, what is the growth opportunity that I can actually capitalize on the best and um, try to identify uh, the company that, 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 uh, needs you. And I mean, it's, it's really interesting to think about that idea where you want to have some kind of idea of what you would want to buy into, because, uh, when you first see some of these options, you don't know which one uh, will be <coughs> best. Like if you look at them the wrong way, then all of them are going to look good. So it's very important to, um, just have the idea or a criteria of what you would be looking for in a company that you would buy. And uh, for some people, like I think one of the reasons they don't get into it right away is because they don't have the funds to do it. And that's unproven uh, for people who haven't done it before. It's unproven. Like you've done it, you know what you're doing. But for someone who's doing this for the first time, uh, they got to prove the concept first and some of these companies cost thousands of dollars to uh, invest in. So how do you recommend we either raise funds in the beginning, save money? Like what's your recommendation for filling in the money gap? Yeah, sure. I, yeah, Mark, I mean, some of them might cost thousands. I mean, others obviously cost millions, right? I mean, if you look at it, you know, only 4% of companies in the United States exceed a million dollars in revenue, right? Only 4%. That's not a lot, right? So the way that I look at it is I'll often, you know, I have bought one company that was less than a million dollars in revenue, but I typically kind of start there myself. And that's just my own personal preference. OK. And, um, you know, when, when you look at these companies, you can, you know, the SBA is basically allowing for cash flow financing up to 90 percent of the acquisition of a business. OK. So, you know, having having started companies from scratch and haven't been out there and trying to raise capital, I got to tell you that two things happen. One, as an entrepreneur, you start to confuse 
uh, uh, getting capital from investors with revenue to your business, right? In other words, just because you get gas in the car doesn't mean you're actually driving anywhere, okay? And a lot of entrepreneurs start to confuse that because the process is exactly the same. I've wasted, mm, I don't want to say years because I usually don't go that long, but I've wasted over 12 months raising capital for startups, right? And that's, you know, for one at a time. It takes time. It takes effort. It's a full-time job in addition to starting the business. One of the benefits of acquisition entrepreneurship is that the SBA recognizes that you know, baby boomers, they haven't said it this way, these are my words, but this is what I think. I think that they see these trends. Baby boomers own more companies than any generation ever in the history of mankind. It's estimated that $10 trillion in business value needs to change hands, right? And in my opinion, you know, I mean, you go read a book like, you know, The End of Jobs by Taylor Pearson, you know, I mean, you look at the, at the evidence out there, it is the, you know, we're coming into a time where entrepreneurial skills are, um, are sort of like the next uh, limiter that, that are going to uh, uh, put new economy and decide who uh, succeeds and who doesn't, right? So right at the time where entrepreneurship skills are coming, you know, are, are, are coming to the top, coming to the surface for us to, to succeed, it's happening right at a time where all of the baby boomers are retiring and there's this massive amount of inventory of companies that, that needs to be acquired, right? It needs to be transferred. In order to buy these companies, the Small Business Administration is now financing up to 90% of the, of the acquisition costs of these businesses, which is a bit staggering. And I wanna be very careful here. I, Mark, I almost didn't write the book because I don't want to be that guy that's telling people to run out and put 10% down on buying a business. That's risky, right? But what I'm saying is, is it's a lot easier than running out there and, you know, trying to raise a bunch of capital for a number of months so that you can build, you know, a new market from scratch and a new product from scratch and hope that you get that right. When I look at, um, uh, you know, the inventory of these companies, it's not only it's not only these these offline kind of old economy businesses, but like I said, they're also cash flow loans. So I'm actually an M and A advisor with Quite Light Brokerage, and we help online entrepreneurs exit their companies. And what I'm seeing uh, in that role is that there are a number of buyers that are savvy to this and are you know putting very little down in order to acquire um, a business that has an infrastructure, has paying customers, has a track record and they can come to the table with a, with a small amount. In fact, it, Mark, if I might, I'm gonna add one example. Sure. Um, about 14 months ago, I started, you know, I own, I own three companies. One of them is e-commerce, I own, I own a bunch of sites. About, about 14 months ago, I started building out a new site. I saw all, it had all the right trends. All of, the, you know, the search volumes were high, the competition was low, and, you know, and I started building out um, content. Um, I, I found some manufacturers that could drop ship for me. And over the course of about 14 months, just through, you know, paid ads, you know, um, content, you know, building the site out, graphic design, you know, um, customer service, accounting, all the rest of it. Mark, I, I frankly have about $60,000 into this startup, okay? As a broker, I sold a company uh, a, a few months ago that sold for exactly $600,000, and the buyer put down 10% of the acquisition and bought a company that was cash flowing 190 plus thousand dollars per year. Just, you know, just as an example. So in the, in the company that I've started from scratch, um, it, it, it never, it still hasn't found that success yet. And so I'm tweaking, I'm pivoting, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. It's the typical startup story, right? 90% of these, of these entrepreneurs are just not going to get very far. Okay. And then the ones that do, the ones that succeed, aren't actually doing as good as you think they are, or they've succeeded in building a lifestyle business for themselves that's fl you know, flying pretty low to the ground. So being able to um, you know, use a little bit of capital and then you know, secure a bank loan for the rest is, is, is you know, uh, really the approach to acquisition entrepreneurship. There's a couple more, which would be raising from friends and family or also going the search fund route. I don't know how, how deep you wanna go into all of that, but in my book, it's more, you know, rather than going the search fund route, it's more the acquisition entrepreneur and how an individual 
can, you know, get capital to move forward and buy a business. And that's uh, definitely something very interesting. You mentioned deep leverage. Definitely, uh, it is risky to go that route. But if your business that you acquire is producing that kind of cash flow where the risk is justified, that is definitely something to uh, look into. And one of the questions that I do have for you is uh, to acquire a business successfully, by definition, you have to spend a certain amount of money acquiring it make changes to the business so that it produces more money than you end up spending on it. But you have to know stuff uh, in order to make that happen. So my question to you is, is it better to start, enter into the entrepreneurial realm uh, by buying a company um, or launching a startup? And my only thinking with the startup is that uh, you learn stuff when launching a startup that you can then use for the company you buy. So I'm really uh, interested in hearing your thoughts on that. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, what's your question? What your question is, you know, should I buy a business with no experience, right? And I say absolutely not. Um, you know, it's getting younger and younger, and and a lot. Uh, and sorry, people who are buying businesses, the trends are kind of getting younger, right? And, and what I mean by that is that um, just because of trends coming out of University of Chicago. Um, uh, Northwestern, Harvard, you know, and, and they're starting to build these, you know, very successful entrepreneurship through acquisition um, courses and, um, and networks. And they're starting to um, uh, find funding through search funds and things like this. And so what you have is a lot of, you know, freshly minted MBAs going on the prowl looking for a, a business to buy. I don't think that that is a bad idea. OK, I'm not I'm not going to shoot that down. Um, but I think that, you know, you know, I ended up getting a little more experience when I completed my MBA before I bought my first business. And frankly, Mark, it was, it was simply because I couldn't navigate how to buy a business. My startup failed and I was met with, you know, I was like, okay, look, I'm an acquisition. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm an entrepreneur and that's sort of my condition. It's right. It's not like a job title. It's like, okay, but my idea had just failed, right? We were finalists in the, in the competition. We came in second you know, we had Walmart like on the hook and all of a sudden our supply chain kind of fell apart and we could not execute. OK, um, so I, was, I started looking for a business to buy. And what I was met with was a really fragmented in industry, a really opaque if it existed at all process and a huge range in quality in terms of business brokers, m and advisors, iBankers, intermediaries. You know, they, all those words really mean the same things. They just kind of imply different levels. Right. Um, and so I actually failed and ended up going corporate for a while. And I'd be lying if I, if I said that every single experience I've had, both in startups and in corporate, um, haven't, haven't helped me significantly. And I do not think that I would be as good of an entrepreneur as I am today. If I'm, if you can say I'm good, if it weren't for those experiences that I had prior. Right. So, you know, between the ages of, I don't know, uh, 20 and 30, um, you know, I really got a lot of experience on, on, I'll just say other people's dimes, right? Like it was either, it was either me doing sweat equity or, uh, it was me going corporate. So, you know, for example, I was a stockbroker during the tech bust. That was my first job out of college. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> and you know, that like that goes a long way when you see all of the startups, you know, during the tech boom start to crumble because they didn't actually create any value. Uh, it was a really interesting time. So, you know, to your question, you know, should I buy a business without, you know, any, any, you know, let's just say real world experience as opposed to like, you know, education, I would say absolutely not. Um, it's, it's critical that, um, you know, you mix education with real work experience in order to fine tune kind of who you are and understand the real value that you bring to a company without being, um, how do I say it? Well, let me say it different. Let me say it the opposite way with being confident with what you can do, right? Uh, definitely some really interesting insights and it's good to have some experiences, uh, Walker pointed out, uh, because if you buy a company and you have no idea how to grow it, you still have a lot of money to pay off if you went that 90% financing route. So uh, you should definitely know your stuff before you buy a company. Um, well, Mark, Mark, if I'm not mistaken, a lot of your audience is um, uh, kind of focused on a side hustle. Is that is that yes. a true statement? Okay, can we can yes. we talk about that for a minute? Can we sort of apply this? 
So one of the one of the challenges that I I give to entrepreneurs is, you know, as you're starting your business, think about what infrastructure it is that you're truly trying to build. Think about what infrastructure it is that would that is, you know, easily um, uh, um, acquisitive, you know, something that you can acquire easily so that your startup can succeed, whether that be a customer base or, you know, certain equipment or, you know, whatever that might be. And for, you know, a, a side hustle entrepreneur, the thing is, is, you know, you can look at you can do this recipe works for lifestyle businesses as well as, you know, middle market, you know, you know, 50 million, 100 million dollar revenue businesses as well. It's the same equation. Right. So, you know, if you want to go buy, you know, an AdSense site that, you know, is is generating revenue through copy, you know, that's something that you can acquire for a relatively low amount. I mean, as you were saying, you know, thousands of dollars, I mean, you can get into you know, a content site or, or you know, a barely successful um, uh, e-commerce site. I mean, something kind of close to the ground, but something that's earning, you know, a thousand or two thousand or three thousand a month. Right. And, you know, if you buy a business even with, you know, 90 percent uh, in debt, um, but it's a small dollar amount, um, you know, as, as time continues, you know, everyone, everyone should only buy companies they're going to succeed at. But should the worst occur, you know, you, you can be spending less than, you know, a, a, an annual salary for someone in their mid 20s and still buy a company. Right. So if you buy a company with 90 percent in debt, probably about 45 percent of that cash flow in very loose math is going to be attributed to principal and interest payments. In other words, if I buy a company that's generating, you know, let's just say three thousand a month. OK, um, you're going to take that. Well, I'm, I'm not as skilled in the valuation of these companies, but I'm just going to give you an example. You take that annual annual run rate, okay, thirty six thousand dollars. You multiply that by some number between, you know, for a company that small, it might be just under two, but I would imagine it'd be somewhere between, you know, one and a half to two and a half, maybe you know, a three three x of that number. Um, and what you're looking at doing is, you know, you you would then put down ten percent of the amount, take a loan on the balance, and then instead of taking home three thousand uh, dollars a month, you're taking home fifteen hundred. OK, and then you're applying that fifteen hundred back to the principal and interest payments. You can choose to take that fifteen hundred out. You can choose to reinvest that fifteen hundred since it's your side hustle and you don't need the money yet to grow it. Or um, you can take that fifteen hundred and apply it right back to principal and pay your debt off even faster. So if you think about it, what you're doing is you're acquiring a company with, you know, a two to three year payback, um, assuming the levels stay the same. So if you grow it you know, the percentage of that principal and interest burden on your cash flow is going to continue to decrease over time. And it makes for probably the strongest return on investment that I've seen in any category. And it's interesting you mentioned uh, that whole approach for paying off the debt, because if we do see this cash flow coming in, uh, you may want to pay more of it off you may want to reinvest it's totally a case-by-case -case basis based on uh, what you want to do and how you can think of ways of using that extra money so that's like a very interesting angle just thinking about how we're going to balance this leverage and uh, pay off the debt and one of the things that i do want to ask you um, because there are a lot of entrepreneurs who listen to breakthrough success I'm wondering if you could share with us what do you believe holds most people back from being successful entrepreneurs? Okay, I think that it's actually, okay, let's do this. Remember earlier I said sense of urgency? A lot of people come in without a sense of urgency. I think that it's it's kind of the lack of goal setting and the lack of, um, having deadlines on your own goals. Like you have to, you have to have self-inflicted deadlines. Like Mark, you are a extremely driven individual. Okay. Um, it's not, it's not an accident that, um, you know, most people don't have a podcast, right? It's not, you know, and, and, and a lot, I don't know, I'd have to look at the statistics. I'm not sure how many people who start podcasts actually make it to over 300 episodes. Right. But the thing is, is you had a vision for what it was that you wanted to build and you just kind of got started. You knew it wasn't perfect, but you just started taking the steps towards achieving your goal, right? Even if your goal was, hey, I want to have, you know, uh, uh, 600 podcasts out by, you know, December 2018, right? Then, and, and 
you know, you're only halfway there, you still have 300 podcast, right? So in other words, I think that working with a sense of urgency and creating deadlines for yourself around a goal that you're trying to achieve is what actually gives people, you know, the sort of drive and hustle to get up in the morning, jump out of bed and, and get hustling. When, during the intro to your shows, you say, hey, I give you three of these a week, right? So you are announcing out to the universe that you're going to deliver on this, right? And so you're holding yourself accountable simply by saying that every time you've got a show. So I think that um, uh, working with a sense of urgency, and let's pull that around to buy then build. If you're wanting to be an acquisition entrepreneur, you can you know, be running your own company in six months, no problem, okay? Um, all you need to do is, you know, go th- you know go through the prep funnel know what you're looking for and you know get out there and start getting some deal flow and figure it out and, and buy i think that a lot of potential buyers uh really look at sellers um pretty critically mark i think that they look at them and say like okay you know i've come in here go ahead and you know pitch me why you know why i should buy your business or whatever right when it's actually the other way around uh the buyer is actually interviewing to be the ceo of the seller's baby right? This, this, this entrepreneur built this business from scratch. They've succeeded. They've built something of value. And now for whatever reason, um, you know, they're wanting to move on and just do something else in the same way that, that many of us do. Um, and so, you know, I think that, uh, uh, buyers that come in working with a sense of urgency, knowing with conviction that they want to become an acquisition entrepreneur and push themselves on a timeline to actually buy, is ultimately at the end of the day the thing that separates you know uh, passive lookers from people who are actually going to pull the trigger. I think it's the same thing with entrepreneurship in general. I really like how you bring up that sense of urgency, as that's going to really ignite a lot of action. When you see that you have a week left to do something, you take a lot more action. Uh, there's Parkinson's law that says the closer something comes, the more likely you are to take action. And look at a lot of college students. I can say this because I am one. When you've got the final coming up, a lot of the studying happens as the final gets closer. And in the perfect scenario, you're supposed to do it gradually. It just does not always happen that way. Uh, So if you're able to, even if you have to insert urgency into the equation, when there's no urgency in the moment, you can really ignite a lot of action and hit more of the goals that you set for yourself. Totally agree. And in addition to that sense of urgency, I feel like that is a really important concept, so I'm really happy we hit on it. But uh, what do you believe are some of the habits that have worked very well for you as not just an acquisition entrepreneur, but also an entrepreneur in general? Sure. So I think that... um... Mark, I, I guess, you know, it's it's kind of funny because um, I started reading recently a book called The Miracle Morning. I'm sure you're familiar with it. It's 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 um, part of what actually pushed me to do it is that it was beating me on the best selling charts. <laughs> it's like, oh, what is it? but the thing is, is that as I'm reading it, it's kind of funny. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I am for most of my life, I was an early riser and. Um, I, you know, I was a big meditator. I taught meditation in college to other students and things like this. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, I always would at the end of my meditation sort of visualize what it was that I wanted to happen. And in 2010, um, I won probably a dozen podiums, um, bike racing and ended up, uh, winning one of the, uh, Missouri state champion jerseys that year. And there was this one race uh, hellbender, right? I mean, the Missouri State race. That there's this uh, this sort of hill that separates, you know, the men from the boys, as as we like to say, right? You know. But anyway, it's it's um it's one of these things where I, I pictured myself attacking on that climb, keeping the gap for the balance of the course, and then you know finishing you know that 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 course. I didn't win that course that year. It also happened to be not the the state road race course that year, luckily. But I, I did podium, right? And so it's one of these things where I went from like dead last to actually being on the podium and getting um, a medal just within about, you know, 24 months. And sure, there's hard work and commitment. But the thing is, is that I saw it. I saw it in my mind's eye and I saw it for many days before it actually happened. And then later that year, I did end up um, uh, winning and taking gold, which was 
you know, so the thing that, you know, so that's a, 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 a you know, a, an example of visualization. I'm, I'm big in exercise. You know, I, I like to, um, I like to wake up in the morning. I like to meditate. I like to think about, you know, picture what it is I'm trying to accomplish. And I like to exercise and just kind of get my body going. And I've been doing this for years. And what I used to say is people would say like, well, you know, how do you like have so much discipline? And I'd say like, I just kind of decide, I don't know what to say. Like I just go deep in myself and decide in my heart that this is the way it's going to be. And that's it. It's, it's, it's over. And, um, now that I'm reading the miracle morning, it's actually putting a, a, a process around exactly a lot of the things that I've kind of stumbled on, um, just on my own over the years. And so, um, it's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to point to a book like that and say, you know, I, I, this book had nothing to do with me, but it's a perfect blueprint for everything that I've been doing. <laughs> and uh, and not only that, but I kind of fallen out of discipline on a on a few of uh, on a few of his attributes. And so I've I've been reading it, and, and you know I started you know adding you know affirmations back in and and scribing back in. Well, I guess I shouldn't say scribing because I wrote my I wrote by then build over about three and a half years, mostly during the middle of the night, right from like two thirty in the morning to seven in the morning. So. Wow. I guess I was doing that anyway, but, um, but there you have it. I, I think that's it. I think it's, it's waking up early and being able to, um, kind of center yourself and tell the universe, uh, what your agenda is rather than the other way around. I really like waking up early. I mean, all those habits are really good, but I feel like if you wake up early and you really seize the day before all the busyness happens before, because who's going to disturb you at 5 a.m. compared to 5 p.m. It's a really big Nobody. difference. Yeah, exactly. Nobody. So, I mean, Wake Up Earlier, Miracle Morning is definitely a great book. We'll link to that in the show notes. Uh, but I'm wondering, Walker, if you could share with us mm. three other books that you believe will have a positive impact on us. Wow. Um, okay. I would say um, there's, um, let's see, does Buy Then Build count? <laughs> <laughs> I would say, you know, okay. So in well, I will say this in buy then build. Um, you know, there's a there's a chapter in there on business strategy and how to sort of engineer the future. In other words, I try to give a toolbox of of things that that you know um, potential acquisition entrepreneurs can can sort of reference in order to analyze you know what's going on. So what I'd like to do is maybe talk about those frameworks and then point to the book in which they arrived. Okay. Um, so in other words. Um, uh, Michael Porter wrote a book called Competitive Strategy, right? And um, in it, he talks about his five forces, okay? And um, having those five forces in terms of, you know, what are what are sort of the threats uh, of, a, of a business and what can actually take it down um, are critical in terms of looking at any business and any business opportunity in terms of protecting yourself against the downside. So, you know, his book was was instrumental to me and I use it frequently. Um, another one is, um, I need a minute to remember it. So I'll, I'll skip on to the last one. So uh, good to great by Jim Collins is probably the best business book ever written. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not a model that fits every, uh, company, but you know, if you don't study the people that, that have had, you know, um, success for an extended amount of time, then you're not going to know what, what builds companies out of brick, so to speak. Right. I mean, you're not, you're not, you know, it, he, his, his entrepreneurs are really CEOs in that book, you know, kind of take the long view in terms of how do we build a business that's different and how do we build a business for enduring success? Um, uh, the innovators dilemma is what I couldn't think about. So, excuse me. So, um, Clayton Christensen, uh, uh, wrote the innovators dilemma and in it, um, is such a critical lesson, Mark. It's it, okay. So the innovator's dilemma is how do I explain this? There's there's a graph that I always show to explain this, but it, it's one of these where the amount of time that an industry exists, okay, um, the more um, the quality of the product goes beyond what the consumer in this example. Uh, demands. Okay. So in other words, you know, um, I really, you know, I need a pen and I need it to write. Okay. And I, and I want it to kind of feel good in my hand. And, you know, I don't know what other attributes you might add to it. Pens today, they're so plentiful. Every single one works way beyond what you, you know, need. Right. I mean, we're not using feathers anymore. Okay. At the same time, uh, emerging technologies, 
uh, the quality is usually below, okay, what we demand. And so it's not until the emerging technology is able to um, cut above that, uh, that line that we're actually willing to adopt it and start using it, okay? I, I accidentally said pen at the top of my mind, so now I'll go ahead and, and use the, isn't it the Apple Pencil? Is that what, they're, what they call that? And, you know, the example here is it's a very good one. Like, they've definitely got it to a quality level that's, you know, beyond certainly beyond what we were seeing five to ten years ago, okay? I mean, these pens, you know, if you remember the, um, gosh, what are those, you know, the trio, and what all you could do is kind of, like, hit it, right? I mean, it wouldn't write. So, you know, we're, 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 we're beyond, you know, sort of minimum viable product and well into the quality. So at what point, you know, does, do the pen companies start to look at, you know, the Apple Pencil sort of technology and say, okay, it's time to stop being profitable, time to, because we're, we're going to reinvest everything we've got into, you know, moving our company over into making these, you know, digital, digital pencils. And, um, that's a pretty, that's a total made up <laughs> analogy. <laughs> what I might point to is sort of like film, right? Like, so growing up, you know, we always had, you'd, you'd go to Walmart, there'd be a whole shelf full of film, right? And you'd buy the film and you put it in your camera and you take pictures and you drop it off. And then, you know, by the time I was in high school, we could get those pictures back in an hour and it was drive through and whatever. And Kodak, even though they invented the digital camera, decided not to take the leap and other people did. Okay. And now, I guess I've worked myself into another Apple example, but you know, now we all take them right on our phones. So you know, the point is, is should Kodak have, have cut their profitability and, and taken, de- taken hold of the digital camera um, I- industry? Because they could have. They were the ones that absolutely could have. And I'm not gonna say why they made their decisions, but you know, it's pretty easy to see that a lot of people made a lot of money by them not making that decision, but it didn't last. And what and you know if they had done that would we all be using Kodak cameras or Kodak phones today? Maybe, right? Because those are the decisions to move to 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 invest in the coming trend that's in, in front of you. And understanding the innovator's dilemma is something that um, uh, I've used over and over and over again. So th- those are those are probably three of, of my top uh, favorite business. Walker, thank you so much for sharing those great book recommendations. Those will all be in the show notes, marketbury.com slash E304. Content marketing secrets will also be in the show notes for anyone looking to get traffic and monetize their content. Uh, so that will be in there as well. But uh, before we do wrap up this episode, Walker, I've asked you several questions to our time together, but what do you believe is one question that we need to be asking ourselves more often? Wow, that's amazing. I mean, I, th- I sorry, I probably accidentally drifted earlier in the in the interview. I think that the number one thing that that entrepreneurs really need to be asking themselves is what is the infrastructure that I'm trying to build? Because I'm telling you, it is so much more affordable if you buy it. Okay, you just have to get creative about how you're looking for it, and it might not look like the vision that you're trying to achieve. And that's okay because that's the opportunity, right? So if what you need is a, is a content site that's successful, that's generating a couple thousand dollars a month, you can find it in a in an industry that's you know in a you know in in a in a category that is a direction you're going, so that you can launch your product or whatever it is that that you want to do. Um, so that's my challenge for entrepreneurs everywhere: is what is the infrastructure you're trying to build, and is starting up really the best way to do it. Walker, thank you so much for sharing with us that question. All of your great insights through our time together. If you guys want to learn more about Walker, get his book, Buy, Then Build. Not only can you find it on a bunch of places like Amazon, but he also has a website for it. So if you go to buythembuild.com, you will learn a lot more about his book. Thank you again, Walker, for coming on Breakthrough Success. Uh, we greatly appreciate you taking the time to share all of your great insights with us today. Mark, keep going on your Breakthrough Success. You're killing it. Thanks for having me. Want to dominate the podcasting industry? Now you can. With your free copy of my book, Podcast Domination, you'll learn how to launch, grow, and monetize your very own show. And whether you are a beginner or an expert, this book has a lot of golden nuggets for you. We'll cover the cost of producing this book. All we ask is that you cover the shipping. To get your copy, head over to markgaberti.com slash pd.